Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. We have a packed, a packed crowd with a lot of familiar and incredible faces. And to those of you we don't know, uh, thanks so much for, for joining us. This is an incredible panel. We're here to talk uh, notionally about tutoring, but I think we should really expand today's discussion from just the idea of high dosage tutoring or high impact tutoring and really think more broadly about the learning recovery and the education model and how it is we assure that what's in place in schools is evidence-based, that we're customizing it to the needs of students, especially those most disadvantaged and disadvantaged by the, the pandemic, and that we're thinking about our recovery as a country and as an education system more broadly. Um, I'm, the, this panel truly needs no introduction, so I'm not gonna spend any time um, uh, going through introductions. We only have 40 minutes. We have a five-person panel, <laughs> and so I think at the risk of not making it through all the things that need to be said, we should just get, get right to it. But um, if you could please welcome uh, our panel this afternoon, we will get right to it. <laughs> so we're gonna start talking about um, just kind of the facts and trying to establish some common fact base about where we are as a country in our learning recovery right now and what it is the evidence tells us about how we might move forward. And I'm gonna start questioning first with you, Kevin, and, and ask you if you could just, in your role as the CEO of a new startup, Accelerate, if you could just give us a kind of a, an overview of where we are as a country in the recovery and, and what you're observing in terms of our, of our progress in this moment. Yeah, um, thanks. It, so I guess I would say we seem to be, the good news is we're sort of making the same kind of progress that we were making before the pandemic, more or less. The bad news is it's from a lower baseline and we're not seeing a lot of catch up in the data. And so we're starting with this baseline that most people in this room know where kids are you know, maybe half a grade level behind where they're supposed to be, um, more in math um, than in reading and more for the kids who were previously behind than for the kids that were tracking to where they were supposed to be. And so the fact that we are back in sort of a cruise control mode is not great when we're starting from farther behind than we needed to be. And by the way, this is a global trend. So um, there's evidence around the world that it's about the same. You know, there was a big international study that showed that globally it's about a third of a grade level in gaps and people are back to cruise control. So that's sort of like the baseline that we're operating from. And I think there is a broad awareness among system leaders that we have this gap and that we need to try to catch kids up. There is obviously the funding um, and there is the effort to engage in recovery through a variety of things, including what we're here to talk about, which is high dosage tutoring. Um, but there is an enormous challenge from a capacity standpoint in trying to actually scale these recovery efforts. So we have this huge challenge of awareness, <clears throat> a deficit, um, an effort to implement something that might catch kids up, and yet we are not close to reaching the number of yeah. kids who need to be reached because of all of the sort of various capacity constraints that we'll probably get into a little bit on the panel. Yeah, and we will get into it, I, I, but I do just want to put a pin in what you said because I do think that hopefully we'll get to a point in the panel where we're really talking about this tension between efficacy and what the evidence shows and then scale and the complexity of the system. I do think it's really important that we ground ourselves in reality. Um, a, a number of us have been administrators of school systems, uh, but there's only one of us who remains an administrator of the school <laughs> system. Uh, to my left, my colleague, longtime superintendent in Miami-Dade, current superintendent in Los Angeles, and thank you, Alberto, for your incredible service and for everything you've done for our kids in our country. Um, can I ask you, would you just kind of give a little bit of a, of a dose of reality to what Kevin talked about? I mean, what, what is your plan? What are you seeing on the ground? What's working in LA? Um, where are your challenges? Yeah, so thank you, John. Uh, so number one, here's the dose of reality. Whether you're looking at NAEP scores or state assessments or probably a multitude of progress monitoring tools that districts are employing, the reality is, is dark. So as far as NAEP is concerned, 20 years worth of progress erased, particularly in reading, even worse in mathematics. Um, disproportionately speaking, uh, the impact was felt in a much more pronounced way in the students who were kids who were at risk in crisis prior to the pandemic. 
And, and we ought to recognize that, by the way, is that, you know, the pandemic, yes, was a crisis that disparaged all kids, but there were kids who were in crisis prior to the pandemic, who today are at a deeper, darker level of crisis than ever before. So for them, the ramp up needs to be much more aggressive. In terms of state assessments here in the state of California, uh, in Florida, certainly with the, with the state assessment there, equivalent loss of six to seven years in English language arts, seven to eight years in mathematics. So meaning kids' performance this past year, you'd have to go back six to seven years to match it. Uh, that means distance from standard in terms of performance in California reading and mathematics, double digit for kids in color, kids in poverty, homeless kids, kids in foster care, students with disabilities and English language learners. So that is the reality. National data, 20 year loss, two decades worth of gains erased, evaporated, uh, state assessments, particularly in the state of California, we uh, regressed about six to seven years. So for those, and there are still some people out there, shamefully, that say that there was no learning loss, whatever you wanna call it. We've politicized so much in this country, including the terminology as to what happened during the pandemic. Kids lost educational opportunity. So the recovery now, you know, for those who believe that the solution is singularly attached to high dosage tutoring, you know, you already failed. It takes a lot more than that. Kids in families in crisis have struggled. Uh, so LA specific last year, less than 10% of the students subscribed to tutoring programs, the vast majority of them not high dosage, not necessarily effective. Everybody wanted to be part of the game because they saw a lot of ESSER opportunity, mm -hmm. but the delivery was uh, subpar. Uh, now we have recalibrated. Uh, we've been meaningful uh, about the approaches. We brought in the best players and we reduced uh, a list of dozens of folks who wanted to do work uh, to the best in class. And this year we've gone from, again, about 9% of the kids in Los Angeles Unified taking advantage of tutor tutorial programs to about over 30% of the kids taking advantage of tutorial programs. Part of our success also has hinged on tiering the approach, knowing that there is an issue of capacity specific to high dosage. Then we said, we're going to reserve those seats for the kids in greatest need, the most uh, fragile kids in our school system. And then tiering it in a way that every kid can take advantage of tutoring programs, but the most effective high dosage, low ratio, uh, that needs to be reserved for the kids who are in greatest needs. Uh, so by tiering, the approach in accordance with the needs of the kids by really firing a lot of companies that were not delivering, elevating the ones that were, concentrating regionally, geographically in quadrants throughout our system so that companies are not eating one another for the tutors themselves or the schools being really deliberate in the deployment. I think we have a chance this year, but again, uh, if we put all of our efforts in terms of recovery on the back of the promise of high dosage tutoring, we will fail. Right. Uh, we have a responsibility to do that right now, develop systems for the long haul, but at the same time, my God, with all this money and time, why don't we re-envision all of public education right now? We have an opportunity to do that. My fear is we're going back to the status quo where we felt comfortable and reestablishing the systems that in many instances failed our kids to begin with. All right, so this is, this is very good, um, and thank you for that, because I think that really gives us some context for Susanna, our next question, then I'm gonna move to Janice. Um, so what, what does the evidence say? And I, I think if you could particularly react to what Alberto said in the, in the LA context, because we've got this kind of, Kevin set up a mandate of, you know, there, there has to be something at scale because this is a problem that exists at scale. But then when we think about scale and when we think about technology and we think about the commercial world that Alberto was describing, it's not maybe such a clear path to scale. So what, what does the evidence say about us, say about uh, uh, the, this moment and where we should go? Yeah, so I think one thing about high dosage or high impact tutoring is that there's more evidence on that than pretty much anything else there is in education because it's not that hard to do a study where you randomize kids to get in and not and then see what happens to them. So we know a lot that this can be a super effective way of having students learn more in a, at a, in a shorter time frame. So the, 
the ability of a tutoring program to work is really strong, but these are tutoring programs that have particular characteristics, and I think that's really important for thinking about the broader picture. So what these, these programs are, are um, programs in which a student has a really positive, strong relationship with an adult uh, in order so that they have the trust in the adult and the motivation to do well. That adult has data on how well the student is, is doing and what are the areas of that student's need. And they also know what to do. They either are really experienced teachers or they have really good materials and some initial training. It seems like you're, a lot of people can be high impact tutors if they have this. And so this idea that students need this close relationship for motivation and this kind of good materials and good instruction targeted at their needs so that they don't have to learn a whole class again. They only have to learn the little bits that they need in order to re-engage in class and move forward. So I think what's, what's important about this is there's a fundamental part of it that we all believe, that students need this in order to do well. But it also doesn't necessarily fit in with how we've set up schools. So the scheduling can be really difficult, especially in high school and in middle schools, uh, getting the the people into tutor can be difficult because we haven't set up pathways to do this. I don't think that this means that we can't do it, but it's a really hard thing to suddenly say, let's do this for everybody. So it's not surprising that we run into these difficulties. And I think instead of saying, oh, we have these difficulties, meaning we can't do it, I think it's much better to look and say, well, we don't really have another option, particularly for students who are disengaged in school, for how we can re-engage them, catch them up, help them see that they're students, and then move forward. And so I think what the research is really telling us now is how do we create these systems, both in the short run where you can partner with vendors who can bring that in and get the students what they need right in the moment, but then how do we change our systems so that there are more adults in the schools that can meet the needs of students, maybe that share their lived experiences more than the current workforce does? Where do we get the materials? All of this stuff that we've been talking about in this conference on AI and stuff like that could provide really strong materials for people who who may not have years of experience in tutoring, but could really work well with the students. So I think we're learning kind of about the barriers, how to get over the barriers, and the fact that scaling in this case isn't taking one program and making sure every district has it. It's thinking about how do we adapt schools so that they can provide this kind of individualized attention to students, and that takes a lot more of work in human resources, work in scheduling, uh, in order to, to pull this off in the long run. So I think we're somewhere between let's work with a vendor and try to get in what is already a high program, but it, uh, a high quality program, but it's hard to reach everybody with this. Let, let's try to change schools so that kids can get this kind of individual attention they need to engage in school and to thrive. So we're, we're kind of coalescing around a vision of something that's not just tutoring, but it has principles that emulate the research that has largely focused on tutoring. Janice. Um, you heard Alberto's telling of the story in Los Angeles. You heard Susanna's discussion of the kind of the, the characteristics of highly effective models. Yeah. To what extent is the research really at work in schools across this country? You are a superintendent in Chicago, CEO. You're, you now run a local nonprofit. You see the whole city there. You mm -hmm. chair Accelerate, the national nonprofit. You see the whole country. To what extent do you think this stuff is actually being done? Yeah, well, I think Alberto's, you know, uh, account of what's happening in LA is pretty consistent about, I mean, of, of what's happening across the country. I think what's different and why Accelerate adds value is you don't have a superintendent who, number one, has the experience that he has, um, leading districts, and can really organize and be nimble and make the changes that are necessary when you see things failing. And so where we try to come in is to really um, learn quickly, but share those best practices so that people who are working on a multitude of things, if you're leading a district, have uh, more guidance in order to address some of these issues. If we take a step back, I think a couple of things happened in response to the pandemic. Number one, everybody kind of panicked and jumped on the same thing. I think we talked about that already. We received a lot of money, more of an investment than we've ever seen in public education at one time, but there was little guidance on what to do. And so everybody was pretty much left to their own devices and trying to figure it out. And I think we're starting to see the effects of that. 
On the other hand, a lot of people benefited from that, if we're being honest about that. And so I think the message that you're hearing from the folks up here who are in the field in one way or the other is that we really have to shift from you know, looking at how many students are using a particular program and how many districts you have signed up and start to look at impact. We got to get back to that conversation around student learning and impact. Otherwise, we will fail students. And I think that that is the message that I personally don't hear enough of us talking about. I think we're still in that recovery, kind of licking our wounds. But at the end of the day, our kids are falling further behind. We're unclear about, about what success is. We're unclear about what assessment means and where it fits in the public education space. And so I think that you know, us being able to identify best practices, putting that information out there, scaling that, is really going to play a role in helping public education recover after this once in a lifetime pandemic. So what, what and, and by the way, I would say our politics, I think, play yeah. a role oh, in yeah. distracting yeah, people and giving them reason not to focus on the stuff that matters mm -hmm. to. So, so what, what is it, and now I'm gonna open it up to all of you, you know, in your own ways, you've each kind of touched on this challenge of, you know there is something, there are principles that work for kids. Yeah. You know it needs to be operationalized, but we're all acknowledging that for whatever reason, yeah. and it's not just unique to this moment, best practice, highly effective model, whatever you wanna call it, is, is not making the, the kind of penetration that we would want. What are the barriers to scale? And I, I mean, you could list, 20 of them, I'm sure, but let's start with Alberto and let's, yeah. go, let's go down here. Um, what, what is the thing that stops this reality from, from happening at the pace that we would wanna see it? So nothing should stop it, but there, there are certainly some challenges, right? I think there are too many people trying to protect their jobs so they don't push the envelope as much as they could because there are consequences. Uh, if you look across the country, there are states that are open-minded to bending the rules to benefit the kid, others are not. There are some settings where the adult certainly overpowers mm -hmm. whatever the moral imperative is for the child, so the, the challenges vary. But let me, let me list a couple of elements that should be easy. The state of California, for example, you know, the fuel force of um, highly effective, the, the possibility of high effective, highly effective tutoring programs is ELOPE. ELOPE is Extended Learning Opportunity Funding. Billions of dollars invested uh, in the state of California. Los Angeles Unified receives a very handsome chunk. Guess one of the challenges associated with that investment. That funding cannot be used within the regular school day. When oh. is the most effective way of deploying high dosage tutoring systems? During the school day, why? Systems that transport kids back to home, if that child has got to get on the bus, they're going to be right. excluded from after school tutorial programs. So creating flexibilities, and we're advocating Sacramento, those flexibilities to allow what research proves to actually be most effective. Push in, pull out, let one additional adult be in a classroom working with one kid or two kids or three kids, or put him in a separate room for a brief period of time, then bring him back into the classroom. Why not? Uh, secondly, right now there is a flurry of activity regarding new entities, new firms, companies, partnerships because of ESSER. Two years from now, uh, ESSER expires. So come on nation, let's get it together. Let's build right now the continuity, the bridge, expand automatically to one or two additional years the use of federal funding so that superintendents uh, are not making rushed decisions in approaches that consume the money so that you don't have to give it back, but actually can plan in a way that addresses the issue. Thirdly, there are ways by which the federal government and state government can incentivize those who are not teachers but can be effective tutors. And right now there is a talent pool uh, challenge. A lot of folks that could be tutors can also be teachers. The same can be said about a school nurse versus a hospital nurse. We're all looking for the same talent and guess what? The talent pool is insufficient. Right. So we need to groom that. And then lastly, we need to find effective ways of really, and this is the most important point, is envisioning high quality tutoring as part of a very complex puzzle of education rather than the alternative when education breaks down. Right. It needs to be seen as an existent, indispensable tool that travels throughout the school day, the school year, as opposed to something that those kids mm -hmm. need because something else failed. Yeah. And to the extent that we do that, we're not fully leveraging the possibility mm -hmm. of tutoring. And I'll throw one bonus round. You know, for the private sector folks, engage in efficacy-based contracting. 
which means there's a baseline agreement regarding the capitation value of the tutoring services. But if I deliver on the fidelity of implementation, meaning I deliver the kids and number of minutes that kids are in touch, have access to the service, then I expect you to deliver on outcomes and results. Okay. And to the extent that you exceed the bottom line, you get more money. To the yeah. extent that you perform below the bottom line and I delivered on, uh, on fidelity, then you owe me money. <laughs> and that's the way the real world works, right? So why not apply that concept to uh, tutoring uh, systems across America? Yeah. And I'm not angry, by the way. No, <laughs> you're, no, no, no. no. You're, what, what I hear is you're, you're in the work. That's what I hear yeah, coming from you. Um, I would, the only thing I would add is, uh, just drawing off our, my experience in CPS, we had a program called Saga, which many people, if you're following this, are familiar with that program. It was studied by the University of Chicago, had amazing outcomes. I mean, outcomes that we've rarely seen in any kind of educational um, intervention. It was done during the school day, very well resourced. Um, but when we looked at um, the cost of the program, I remember it was about $2,600 per student at the time. And we were so proud. We were sharing this data in a room full of principals. And the first thing they said is like, give me $2,600 per student and we'll get those outcomes too. And, you know, it was a little tongue in cheek um, um, exchange. But the reality is we have to figure out how to do this well and effective and it can't cost $2,600 per student. We just don't have the money. We don't even have that right now with the extra infusion of cash, cash from ESSER. And so one of the reasons why I was interested in Accelerate and, and really taking this on is one, transitioning. I wanted to you know, see what's happening and really see how we recover as a country um, from the pandemic, but to also help us figure out ways to do what we know works based on the research that Susanna and her team have done, University of Chicago has done, and so many others. But we have to learn how to do that in a much more uh, effective way for more students. And I still don't think we've figured that out yet, but I feel like folks were waiting, you know, in the schools and school districts are waiting for us to figure it out. Um, because it can't be an add-on to Alberto's point. It has to be a part of a student's experience when they go to school. Just like, if we're all being honest, many of our children's experience, right? They go to schools. You want to make sure they have access to a high-quality curriculum. But you also peel in those extra resources to help them accelerate and get to the next level. So why do we think about it as remediation when we do it for low-income students or children of color? We really have to reframe how we think about tutoring. And again, we have to be very honest about the effectiveness of it. Um, otherwise, it's going to be another flash in the pan, and we'll be talking about something else three years from now. Kevin. Um, so at the school level, a couple things we've seen. One is it's difficult at the building level to get people to cough up the time. Mm -hmm. um, even when the districts are asking schools to cough up the time. And two, part of why that's the case is it's difficult to get people to stop doing things that they're already doing as interventions. And so, you know, schools already have various tier two interventions that they've been doing, they've spent money on, there are sunk costs, they did professional development, people have been trained on them over the years, and there may or may not be a base of evidence that supports that work. And getting people to stop things that don't have a base of evidence in order to implement something that does have a base of evidence is hard. It's just change management down at the building level. Um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, from a scaling perspective, it feels like we've got two tracks. We've got districts that are building up their own programs in a sort of methodical, thoughtful way where we are going to recruit people to be tutors. We're going to use the curric we're going to use the curriculum that matches with the tier one curriculum that we've already invested in. And um, we're gonna follow all the principles of high dosage tutoring, but managing a large scale human capital project like that is very hard. And so the places that have done that are stalling out at a low scale. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, you've got places that are contracting with providers. And honestly, the challenge and probably pertinent to a lot of people in this room is we don't have enough providers that have a track record of evidence and are at scale. Mm -hmm. And so if a superintendent calls and says, hey, what do you have for you know, fill-in-the-blank subject, you're lucky if you can come up with one or two names 
that actually would be able to suddenly go into a district and serve um, that district at scale. So we've got a provider scale and evidence challenge, and we may come back to this later, but Alberto's point about where things are going with contracting is something that people really need to wrap their heads around because as the money starts to dwindle on the public side, I think you are going to see a mm -hmm. massive ramping up of evidence-based outcomes-based contracting and people need to have evidence that they can do the work. Yeah. Mm. And the money will dwindle down. I mean, right. look, at, right. look at Washington, D.C. There will not be mm -mm. an appropriation that will provide the continuation of ESSER funding, no matter what. So, you know, we're a point of inflection here where, where I think you're right. One good outcome, I think the silver lining will be that the weaker performers are going to be weeded out. Mm -hmm. And the stronger performers that have the courage to actually negotiate contracts that take into account efficacy right. will survive. And I think there's a great chance at that point for them to be part of the fabric of the educational opportunity for kids, which, by the way, cannot be, cannot be. I mean, the, the tutoring, another example. We need to stop funding schools and education on the basis of seven hours and 20 minutes, mandated seat time, Carnegie units, and all that craziness. To the extent that we continue to do that, we leave kids behind. To the extent we actually look at how kids learn and live and exist and entertain themselves and build the experience and fund the experience with all of its inputs in an organic, flexible way, kids will learn. And I think that could be the case uh, specific to high quality tutoring that we're discussing today. It's, it's been interesting, Suzanne, I wanna ask you in a second about your perspective on barriers and opportunities, but um, it's been interesting that you know, we've, the issue of technology hasn't, hasn't come up here. And I, I do, and after we hear from Susanna on barriers and opportunities, I wanna pivot to that because we talked about finance reform. We talked a little bit about politics. We talked about coherence. You talked about, Kevin, about basically management and organizational issues, which probably somewhat is germane to our shared line of work. Yeah. Um, but it's also an acknowledgement that the system hasn't really prepared itself for this. Uh, I think there's a, you know, it would be easy to kind of look at the providers and to look at the tech and say it's ready or it's not ready. But we're kind of acknowledging here we haven't done what's necessary to stimulate the market to be ready in the, in the right way. Susanna? Yeah, so I'll, actually I'll touch on something uh, relevant to that, which I think you can kind of split the tutoring world in some ways into two parts. And, and early <coughs> literacy in particular is separate from everything else. I actually think we're in a place in early literacy where we can scale. We just did an evaluation of a program in Broward that's already serving 10,000 kids there in early literacy, and we found huge effects. I was kind of shocked. Uh, by the end of kindergarten, more than double the proportion of students in, these, in this program reached uh, the proficiency level that they were aiming for. So something like the difference between just over 30 to almost 70%. So this is, these are huge differences from this. And I think what's different is in early literacy, we, we really have the technology to do it. So we, ha we, we have really good materials. We have platforms that tutors can use that will help them know exactly what the student knows and then what to do as a, in response to that. And in addition to that, you can build that tutor's time into the regular classroom because in kindergarten, in first grade, there are rotating times in the classroom, so it's kind of natural for students to do different things. There are often more than one adult in the classroom. We're just much more flexible at that time period. So I think there's both the structure of schools and the technologies that we have available, some of which are you know, plug in and have batteries technologies, but some are just really good materials for, for tutors. And we shouldn't um, underestimate the importance of that kind of, of instructional technology as well. Then once you go into the, the higher grades, it gets much more difficult because of, of the rigidity of the classes, uh, but there, there is, you know, RTI and MTSS, which in theory was this idea that students would be in tier one and the ones who had trouble with and could use additional supports moved into tier two. And then with that additional supports, they could move back. We don't really have that, right? They go to tier two. It's, it's like a, a path into special education, but it doesn't have to be. Like we have in some schools, we've got these kind of intervention periods that allow for it, and we're finding that places that have those are better able to incorporate this kind of high impact tutoring into what they do. So I think we've got the beginnings of structures in schools to, to help this happen. We're just not there. And I just want to reiterate the importance that I see of the state governments in helping push this forward in guidelines about 
uh, which programs are good, in how you can use different kinds of funds for this, how it might fit in, examples of how it might fit in. So I think there's really a role at this upper level that can help schools have the leverage to make the kind of changes that we need. I would just think about these two time periods separately because I do think we can scale this for young kids. I think there's someone here from On Your Mark, which is another program that we've just seen positive effects of in, in early elementary. So there's, there is this kind of base there that we don't have in the upper grades, and in the upper grades we need to build towards it. And that's fascinating. I mean, especially in light of as much attention and capital as going toward early reading, and, and yeah. um, wonderful to hear your, your study. Let me just pivot for a second. You know, this room, I'm guessing, is half, probably more than half people who are somehow involved in, in probably typically the commercial side of, of the technology and the education technology business, maybe the investor side, maybe they're actually um, product managers themselves. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about technology. I mean, in fact, this has taken a decidedly more old school turn than I was mm -hmm. expecting. Uh, maybe that just means we're old, but nevertheless, uh, you know, we've talked about procurement. We've talked about RTI. I mean, these are old things. Um, has technology been an accelerant to progress? Has it been an inhibitor to progress? How, how do, you know, none of you are technologists, as, insofar as I know, by, uh, by background, what, do you, what are your hopes for technology? What are your disappointments with technology in this, in this particular arena? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think we did allude to it a little bit all in different places. Um, for me, um, technology plays an incredibly important role. I think you're right that districts are not organized and um, the pandemic, which this was a positive thing that was the result of the pandemic, I think it forced a lot of us to do work um, in a space that maybe would have taken a longer time. One example is in CPS, we instituted for the first time a pre-K through 12 curriculum, uh, which was online, student facing. We had never done anything like that in the district. And the initial plan was like a two year rollout and it was all about teaching people how to use technology and flip classroom and all this other kind of wacky stuff. And because of the pandemic, we were like thrusted into it. So it was like my PE class when I, did not learn how to swim, but was supposed to learn how to swim, just thrown in the deep. Um, and, and I think that we just saw mixed results um, as a result of that. I think what I would say, and others may disagree, I think there's a lot of value and power in using technology in public education going forward. I think there's an expectation of that now. I think teachers are much more open to it. I think, you know, I don't know if people in the space can talk about this, but I know 10 years ago, it was a debate about the use of technology and tools in the classroom to do this. And now I think we're at a place where it's generally accepted. I think the places where people are disappointed is that it's very hard to point to the um, efficacy of that because there isn't a lot of research to support the work. So you end up talking about things that have either been you know, widely adopted, teachers kind of like it, you know, maybe the interface is good, but we haven't seen enough in this space around this truly produces outcomes that are very different than what would happen in a traditional classroom. And I think until we start seeing that in mass, like people are gonna still do what they have always done because it's what they know. And, you know, there's just, it's more battle tested, I would say, than some of the newer stuff. I think there's great potential for technology to help educators do a better job, to, to help them get all the information that they need and know what to do with that information, present it in a way that is, you know, the much lower cognitive load than here is all of your test scores on the, in, and each question and what the kids in your class did. It's very hard to take that and know what to do with it. But if you've got something that's much more adaptive that says, oh, look, they seem to be able to do this, and so maybe one way you could address them, it doesn't have to be exactly what the educator does, but it, it can give them something to, to build off of. I think there's a lot of potential there, and combining it with some work that students do uh, directly. I, don't, I just think we shouldn't think about it as totally sub, substituting for the educator, because there is this motivation and, and trust and actual desire for students. I think we're seeing in a lot of the opt-in programs in tutoring, for example, that only the really engaged students opt in. That's not surprising. They love school. They want to opt in. I I think it's going to be somewhat the same if you just give uh, you know a really good um, 
platform or something where they can learn math, they're only going to do it if they really want to. And we haven't figured out how to get around the kind of connection to a human in terms of that being the motivating factor. And so I think we should think about the kind of social context that it's in and then bring the technologies to, to make that easier for the adults to be able to work effectively with the students. And connection to a specific known human, not just a some random old human. Right, that shows up you, you on have to have the right. same yeah. human over yeah. a long period of time, so yeah. you've got that trust. Yeah. Now, what I'll say about go ahead. Yeah. No. No. Please. I don't. Yeah. I, so I I would just say you know with tech there is a lot of synchronous delivery online of tutoring that's happening, and that is helping to drive down the price point and to open up the market for who can become a tutor, and I think that's good. Um, and, but what we haven't seen are the things that are truly just the tech is delivering the instruction in a way that is advancing outcomes um, consistently. And I think the question is, will we see it? And I guess if you're asking what's the hope, um, well, if you think about tutoring and what the evidence shows, there are a wide range of people who can be tutors. So that is a good thing, that's a positive thing. Yeah. You need time during the day, and then you need content that is aligned. And one of the content challenges that people face in the tutoring space is you want content that meets the kid where the kid is, but you also want it to tie to the tier one curriculum that they're seeing during the day. And triangulating that from a content perspective is really hard. I think there's enormous promise and potential that over the next couple of years, the advances that we've seen could create a content revolution that will start in tutoring and eventually spread into the general classroom. And my thoughts about it are, number one, in Los Angeles, we have currently about 100,000 students who are taking advantage of tutorial programs online, 100,000. Wow. I mean, anything in LA is big, just like anything in in Miami is big, like anything in New York, we don't talk about New York, would have been big. <laughs> um, with that said, there's a golden opportunity here. You know, that's again, one of the silver linings of the pandemic is the nation jumped to one to one very quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it took that level of crisis for us, for us to solve for that. So everybody's pretty much connected. Every kid has a device. That was the case in Miami, it's the case in Los Angeles. My concern is that probably families and students are taking advantage of less than 10% of the potential of the device and the connectivity. So there's huge potential for growth. I think the private sector, the providers in this space, many have terrific content. Alignment is sometimes the challenge. They have terrific content, they have terrific tools, they have terrific talent. They can lead more aggressively in the one arena where the public school systems across America usually do not make investments because they're usually criticized in the marketing, awareness, publicity of the opportunity. I think if I contract with XYZ tutoring firms, they ought to understand that it is part of their problem to solve to connect meaningfully with families and students in the community. It cannot just be the responsibility of the school system. Now, there are entities out there, for example, all here, there are entities out there that meaningfully connect families to the school system for the purpose of attendance. How about this? One-stop shop solutions for attendance, for enrollment, yes. for systemic enrollment in tutorial programs. What parents, particularly parents and families in need, in poverty, English language learners, what they struggle with is that they have to navigate a series of different platforms with different protocols for signing on to get yeah. to support in reading or mathematics or attendance support or mental health support or social emotional support. How about making it easy for the parents and anybody who wants to play in that sandbox needs to agree to collaborate in the access of the data, plug into one platform that no matter how complex it is behind the curtain, it is seamless and easy to use by the client, the end user, whether it's the child, or the parent in LA, this is called IAP, where I'm forcing all of the entities to collaborate and participate in the individualized acceleration plan for every single kid out of our 540,000 kids. Meaning we, have, we are data rich in America, demographic profile, socioeconomic profile, we have everything about kids and families, but we are 
user poor in terms of utilizing that data. And the shift for us is going to be, and this is a challenge for those, by the way, a standing room only in a tutoring session. Six years ago, this would never have happened. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. But what I'm looking for is all the players using big data, automation, AI, mm -hmm. to develop this one-stop shop that provides the prompts, identifies the needs, provides the dosage requirement for the students with the prompts for the parents simultaneously, with direct reporting to the teacher, to the superintendent, and through the parent portal, information uh, to the community. It's out there. What I see is reluctance in terms of private sector entities collaborating in developing what, what we as educators actually need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't just want the reading person, math person, the tutoring person, the attendance person, and the enrollment boosting person. How about this? Figure it out. We're gonna start putting RFPs out there and RFIs saying, you collaborate, you identify the best in class and bring solutions that are coherent, one-stop shop solutions for parents and kids. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we will continue to lose. But I think technology is a huge player. We have, yet again, a golden opportunity to revolutionize uh, education in America if we get it right. If we get it wrong, mm -hmm. guess what? We'll be back into race to the top discussions. After billions of dollars of investment, people will ask, what did you do with it? And is America better as a result of that? And I'm concerned about that. Is our ability, two years from now, to prove whether it is high quality tutoring or something else, that those dollars actually created a necessary bump in student achievement uh, in America's kids. Mm. Yeah. We could have this conversation all afternoon. And uh, I wanna thank you for taking the time to, to talk with us. Our time is up. Uh, but more importantly than that, I wanna thank you as colleagues and friends for your incredible service. And I think we all owe this panel a round of applause for that.